Hello and welcome everyone to another complimentary Green Tech Media webinar. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars we do throughout the year to help keep professionals in the solar market informed through research and analysis on the latest technologies and market trends. Today's presentation, Designing for Wind in the Age of Mass Solar Tracker Deployment, is brought to you by Next Tracker. During today's webinar, we will hear from Alex Riddell, the Director of Design and Engineering with Next Tracker from Dr. David Banks, Principal at CPP Wind Engineering Consultants, and we'll also hear from Jake Marin, Structural Engineer at Structurology LLC. I'm Ben Gallagher, a Senior Analyst with GTM Research, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Green Tech Media delivers business-to-business -business news, market analysis, and conferences that inform and connect players in the global clean energy market. Our coverage extends across the clean energy industry with a focus on solar power and the electric utility market's evolution. GTM Research is the market analysis and consulting arm of Green Tech Media. You can stay informed by reading the news on greentechmedia.com and find out more about our research products by visiting gtmresearch.com. Uh, in addition, we also have two events coming up, one on November 13th in Austin, Texas, our Power and Renewable Summit, and we also have our Energy Storage Summit in San Francisco on December 11th. Uh, it'd be great to see some of y'all there. Um, let's see, before we get started, um, I'd like to take a moment to go over the screen in front of you. For those of you who have attended GTM webinars in the past, you may notice a few changes. Speaker bios are now accessible from the top tabs by clicking on each speaker's name. You can use the link on the left-hand side of your screen to download a copy of today's, of the copy of today's slides from the, the webinar. Most importantly, please note that the Q&A module on the left side of your screen. At any time during today's presentation, you can submit your questions for our speakers. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, the global utility PV pipeline is huge. There are hundreds and hundreds of gigawatts of utility scale PV in development. Uh, due to falling costs and EPC turnkey prices, more and more systems are being built in countries, markets, geographies, region states, whatever you want to call it, um, that have not really been exposed to solar uh, previously. Uh, once non-existent or nation markets are becoming emergent markets. Um, so it's really important that all of us throughout the industry, as we encounter more and more stakeholders who are unfamiliar with the complexities of, uh, of solar, and in this case, utility scale PV, um, that we really have all of our ducks in a row and we have um, a clear understanding of what are the best practices to designing and, and operating utility scale PV systems, especially in the era of extremely low PPA prices. So let's just look at the U.S. as an example uh, to begin with. So the project timeline for a utility scale project can be anywhere up to three years. Um, so though the pipeline is quite large, um, we won't see massive installations or deployments of utility scale PV until, until around 2020. Um, However, in looking historically, the utility scale solar market is quite large compared to just a few years ago. Um, so let's dive into the pipeline itself and, and not just look at installations. So here at the, the US pipeline, um, we currently have about 33 and a half, 33.7 gigawatts of utility scale PV operating here in, in the United States. Um, if we look at the, the middle bar, there are 23.9 gigawatts of, of PV, utility scale PV that's already contracted. The little, little blue portion on the top of the bar, uh, that's 4.2 gigawatts of utility scale PV, that's already under construction. So then looking at the announced or, or pre-contract pipeline, that's 36.1 gigawatts, and just that announced pre-contract pipeline is already larger than the cumulative installed capacity of utility-scale solar here in the U.S. So as costs begin to fall and new and more and more new stakeholders 
uh, start to explore the possibility of deploying PV as the economics of PV begin to improve. Uh, we're beginning to see solar, as I mentioned previously, in, in new markets and new geographies. Uh, particularly here in utility scale solar in the US, obviously there's still tons of projects on development in California and North Carolina. Um, those have always been solid utility scale PV states here in the US. Um, but we're seeing systems being developed in Kansas and South Dakota and Maine and Vermont. Uh, today, if you were reading the news, um, Conti Solar announced that they're uh, beginning to uh, develop the largest project in, in Rhode Island, um, in Rhode Island's history. So a lot of really exciting stuff in, in new geographies is starting to take shape here in the U.S. If we look at this like on a, on a regional level, we'll see that uh, there are several regions where the contracted pipeline is, is substantially larger than that of uh, cumulative operating capacity, uh, in particular in the, US, in, the, in the Midwest and the Northwest. Um, and then in the out years, what we forecast is tremendous growth in these uh, parts of the country that, again, are, are unfamiliar with, with PV or less familiar with PV. So as I mentioned, this is primarily due to the falling construction costs, the all-in costs of utility-scale solar. And despite um, you know, a, a market that's been defined in 2018 by protectionism, either from the Section 201 module tariffs, steel tariffs, or tariffs announced today that will impact um, internationally manufactured inverters. Uh, despite all those headwinds, the market is still characterized by uh, consistently falling prices and costs. And we still expect to see that going forward uh, in the next five years. That means even more deployments uh, in, in, in new markets. And this is translated to Record low PPA prices. Uh, here we have on this little graph um, PPA prices in uh, for a few projects, and obviously these are all states with really strong solar resources. But this is this means that we're no longer seeing uh, systems that have PPA prices below thirty dollars per megawatt hour as an anomaly. This is this is starting to become uh, the norm in at least some parts of the U.S. Uh, we won't see prices this low in the near term in places like, you know, Maine or Kansas necessarily, but there'll be more and more projects that have this sort of um, uh, financial pressure uh, going forward. So if we, we zoom out and leave the United States here for a moment and we look at, um, at the globe, we have several areas of the world that have been talked about uh, primarily in the Middle East for many years as a potential strong market. Um, however, very few deployments have been realized. Now there are large contracted pipelines uh, in Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, and also to a lesser extent in Russia and, and Africa. Um, as we can see in Oceania, primarily in Australia, there's a gigantic project uh, pipeline. And these projects too are characterized by really low uh, PPA prices. Um, we continue to see records for PPA prices being smashed uh, globally. But we all know that solar, especially utility scale solar, is not maintenance free. Um, and as systems are beginning to be deployed in, in new geographies with new topographical challenges, um, with stakeholders who are not familiar with the design or operational complexities, of utility scale solar, um, it's really important that us as an industry make sure that our best practices are, are clear and codified as system prices continue to fall and deployments increase in, in new geographies. So for the remainder of this hour, we'll have uh, next tracker talk about their, their approach to developing these best practices. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Alex. All right, thank you for passing off the presentation. Uh, I first just want to thank everyone for joining us and discussing what we feel is one of the most important discussions happening within solar today. And that has to do with how wind affects PV structures, and especially when you look at battling a different aspect of uh, climate change in extreme weather is how do we combat 
these huge wind speeds and really wind speeds we see on an annual basis. Um, so let's dive into this. Uh, so my name is Alex Rodell. I'm Director of Design and Engineering at NextTracker. I've installed and, or I should say, I've been responsible for the design and engineering of over 14 gigawatts in every corner of the globe. So really, I, I've seen it all. Um, and next, I'll pass it off to Dave Banks at CPP to introduce himself. Hi, this is uh, Dave Banks, CPP Wind Engineering in Colorado. For the past 20 years, I've been working on um, how winds affect structural design. <clears throat> and uh, for the past 10, it's really, I've really been focused on wind loads on uh, solar racking systems like the one we'll talk about here today. And I'm uh, Jake Morin. I'm a structural engineer at Structurology Incorporated. We're a um, consulting structural engineering firm um, that does all types of structures, but I've been personally really focused on solar and in particular tracking systems, dual and single access for the last 10 years. All right, thank you guys. Um, so uh, for those of you not familiar with us, we are Next Tracker and we're backed by Flex. Um, so why so much of this is so important to us is we have more trackers out there globally than anyone else. So when you look at uh, the locations of our offices and the locations of our projects, we really are in every corner of the globe. So to us, why this is so important, especially having that parent back guarantee, is that even just 1% of failures could lead to huge amounts compared to any other company. So this wind analysis is just so important to us and really the industry in general. Um, also for those who are unfamiliar with us, we do have a full product offering. Um, we have NX Flow and NX Drive, which are part of our storage components. But today we're going to be talking about our NX Horizon, which is our flagship tracker product, which is, of course, backed by True Capture, which optimizes yield enhancement. So let's, let's dive into this. Um, so really, why are we bringing this up? Um, overall, uh, we've seen a rise in extreme weather. And if you look at a study released by GQ, uh, about 50% of insurance claims with, with respect to these solar power plants are related to weather. And that, that's really a step that should jump out at you. And then if you think about a solar racking, really that percentage of claims is going to rise way up. So what we need to do, if solar is going to be that number one energy source that all of us hope it's going to be, the industry needs to mature as to how we combat with these extreme winds. So with that, I'm going to pass off to Dave to explain really the cornerstones of doing this wind analysis. All right, so this diagram represents what I consider the three pillars of design for a single axis tracker. It'd be a little different for other solar products, but we're focused on the single axis tracker here today. And it goes in a circle because they all depend on each other, but I'm going to start with the conventional starting point, which is the static wind tunnel test at the top. From the static wind load, you design the stiffness and select your materials. And then you should really check whether you've got issues with um, modal excitation or buffeting. Um, and we'll talk about that in some more detail towards the end of the presentation. But for me, the biggest of the three pillars here for single axis trackers is this third one. And that is an aeroelastic response um, and a potential for instability. Because this will send you right back to the drawing board and force you to start the whole design over from scratch. Um, a structure that moves enough in the wind that the motion of the structure changes the flow around it is aeroelastic. And if that change makes things worse, then it can be unstable. And we've seen evidence of that in um, single axis trackers, and so we'll jump right into the details of that. This is a, um, a simple prototype model to, to um, examine this failure. You're looking at it in slow motion. and it's pretty easy to mock up a model that will create this instability. Uh, in this particular model, it's a full wing of a tracker, so it's fixed at one end and free to move along the entire span. Um, but you can also just mock up a single uh, section through it, a span, um, a, a section model test, and produce the instability. The hard part is turning that critical wind speed, the speed at which the uh, instability begins, above which the instability will happen into um, some, a design number that's applicable to a specific tracker. 
Um, there's a lot of parameters involved, and we'll look at some of those as well. Um, this is a more advanced model. So that initial one was sort of a quick mock-up, and now we're looking at a model. Um, it, the floor is open, so we can see the mounting structure underneath, but we wouldn't run a real test with the floor open. This model has uh, a damper on it. It's got accurately um, a designed weight of the panels to represent the, uh, the stiffness of the torque tube. Um, so we've gone, we've got to create an accurate scaled model of the tracker, which moves the way to the tracker. In this next slide, we see what is the final step of a good aeroelastic test. It's a, it's a full model um, array. We've got um, six aeroelastic models in the tunnel. And again, we slowly turn up the wind speed until the trackers start to um, go unstable. And that is how we define the, the critical wind speed. You'll notice the second row uh, behaving very oddly. It's actually nose down into the wind. That's because of the wake of the first row. And there's significant interaction between the rows. One of the questions we get a lot is, well, will the interior rows be protected or sheltered from the outside? Well, yes, but how much? And you can't figure that out unless you, you model an array. Yeah, so Dave, so I, noticed, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I noticed a lot of companies uh, do full-scale model tests. Uh, would you say that's more accurate or less accurate than this? Well, if you can do a full-scale test um, of an array out in the real world, that's the best thing, you know, that nothing beats that. But um, that's fairly difficult. You need to instrument and accurately characterize the wind flow. So then it becomes tempting to put a full-scale tracker into, say, a big aerospace or a big um, automotive wind tunnel. Um, but they don't have the right kind of flow. It's not turbulent. You typically can't get enough of the tracker in there to really characterize what's going on, enough rows, enough part of the span to really see what's going on. So um, I don't think it's a, a really viable solution. You know, you end up having to shrink the tracker a little bit to fit it in there, and now you're back to scale model testing. Um, so this now, this is an image of a section model. And I mentioned earlier uh, that you need to be careful with section models because they um, don't represent the full span of the tracker and they don't represent uh, what it's like to have multiple rows. But um, if you can calibrate your section model with some good um, full tracker testing uh, and convince yourself that it's accurately capturing what's going on, you can learn a fair bit. And particularly if you do a computer model. So this is a, a computer model of the flow. And you'll see as the tracker begins to rise up, a vortex gets shed off the top of the leading edge and then off the bottom of the leading edge as it comes back down. And then each, with each cycle, the amplitude is increasing. This is the kind of instability that's typical for a low tilt. We call it torsional galloping. Um, it's not very easily treated with damping. Uh, it's a very robust instability. And what you're seeing there is about how long it would take the thing to uh, to break in the field. It, it's really something that happens in two, three seconds. This next kind of instability is a vortex lock-in. You see a vortex being shed from the leading edge on the bottom and then the trailing edge on the bottom. It's sort of alternating. And that is the same kind of a vortex street that you'd see behind any structure. And if it matches the resonant frequency, the natural frequency of the structure, the structure will get moving. And this instability can um, transition if it gets going um, strongly enough into a, a torsional galloping. So there can be an interplay. This instability is quite different from the other one. Um, when you just do a section model test, you won't realize that you've got two different instabilities that are overlapping um, and that they scale differently. So interpretation of these tests is, is really very important, how to, how to look, at them, look at them accurately. Dan? Dave, if I could chime in here. This is, this is Jake. One of the most interesting things we saw coming out of your study was sort of the the frequency that you could expect to see something like this happen, right? And we all know it's been general practice in the industry for some time to stow trackers at zero degrees. And um, the assumption is that once you get to stow, you're safe, right? And, and structural engineers have sort of been operating under this assumption that if, if I get to zero degrees, then I can start to design for my code level wind speed, that 300 year wind speed that's 100 miles per hour or um, 115 miles per hour. But this is a, a plot that we pulled for the, the wind speed on a, a site in the US at a certain airport. 
and on the vertical axis is the the wind speed in miles per hour, and on the horizontal axis is essentially the likelihood of occurrence in terms of average recurrence period in, in years. And what I've bracketed here is uh, the sort of the range that you indicated for various types of single axis architectures that would trigger this instability, right? That's right. So the instability happens at a speed typically that's quite a bit below the design wind speed. So you've been focused on the 300 year recurrence interval speed for your tracker and stow, but you're never going to get there because this instability will happen sooner. And, um, you know, we get approached every, every few months by someone who's had an incident like this where um, they had a tracker break in torsion at speeds that they know because of the anemometers on site were well below um, what it should have taken to, to cause a problem for uh, static loads. And generally, this is the reason. It's, it's, it's triggered um, one of the instabilities, uh, de you know, depending on what their stow policy was. Right. Yes, yeah, so you're talking about winds that happen, you know, every six months or every six years. And so if you've made it through three years, well, you know, um, the odds that you get through, uh, you know, 25 years without seeing one of these uh, 60 miles an hour is pretty low. Right. So why, can you maybe talk about, you know, engineers are so focused on this 300-year wind speed, shouldn't the code cover us here? Oh, the code, right. Okay. So... <clears throat> I mean, essentially, the code doesn't have much to say about these kinds of structures. Um, there is an entry in there for essentially a carport. It was based on testing, or it was validated by some testing of a structure, the structure in the lower left corner of the image here. That's a small carport. Uh, the model in the tunnel was six inches wide and three inches across. They tested both a uh, gable roof and a, and a monoslope and, and verified that the loads in the corner support columns would be um, about what was in the code. But that's not how these systems are supported, single axis tracker. Um, it doesn't give you the loss in correlation with a big long span. It doesn't give you the effect of being in the second row. It doesn't give you the effect of having a much wider aspect ratio. It doesn't give you the effect, I mean, sometimes when we test an array, as is shown on the right of this image, we'll find that the worst load might be in the last row or in the second row, depending on what load effect you're interested in, whether it's a, a torque on the whole row or a, a load on a single pier. So uh, the, the code does not, um, does not provide good static wind loads, and it also doesn't provide the kind of details that you'd like. When you get a wind tunnel study done, you now have wind loads as a function of what row you're in, where you are in that row, um, how far apart your posts are, because that affects the correlation and the loss of correlation, um, whether you've got a cantilever at the end of the row. So all of these details, which are needed to really refine and shave out the excess and hit the price points you're after, you, you're not going to get out of a code. Um, so, so that's the static load, but, but really the biggest thing that's missing out of the code is probably that they tell you that one hertz is uh, a rigid structure and that you don't have to worry about dynamic excitation through buffeting. Um, and this is an animation that Jake's worked up of a five bay wing of a tracker, and this is one of the higher modes, as Jake will, Jake will explain in a minute, um, bouncing up and down. And this mode is typically in one of these tracker systems somewhere uh, at the two, three, four hertz range, um, which is nominally um, a safe uh, high frequency for, for not having to worry about um, dynamic expectation. But in fact, in, in an array of trackers where you've got the wakes of the upwind trackers and vortex shedding off the trackers, that's actually perfectly tuned to give you the most dynamic response you can get at the design wind speed. Um, but yeah, the, the interesting thing about this, Dave, is you know, in, in this specific case, this tracker, um, this is sort of like a generic tracker that, that I've worked up here. This is about the fourth or fifth, fourth or fifth mode of vibration. And what I've seen from um, reviewers um, is that they tend to focus in on that first mode of vibration. So they say, show me your first mode of vibration, show me how you've addressed it, and then everything's okay. When in fact, this mode of vibration, which is rarely addressed, can actually have a big impact in design. And you can see amplifications of loads for this mode of vibration on the order of anywhere from 1.5 to 3. So in other words, you could get up as high as 300% of your static load just from this mode of vibration that really isn't being addressed. And so 
my general recommendation is that you know racking companies, and this covers all types of racking, not just trackers, but racking companies need any vibration less than six hertz is a pretty good rule of thumb. So, you know, it, some of these can be damped out, and you know, we we were limited on time here, but the wind tunnel studies are really sort of the first part. So you can't really get a good design unless you have good load inputs from a structural engineering perspective. So you need to get good loads. But then after that, the question is, what do you do with those loads and with all that data? And here's one small example. This is a, a, a finite element time history model where we've sort of implemented some dampers in the model space and we're tracking damper displacement and damper mag load magnitude, right? And then next tracker will go and take this out and actually develop a spec and a testing spec for their dampers. So if you're an owner of the EPC, how many times have you seen a spec that says a damper is expected to see this amount of load for this amount of cycles for this period of life? So that's that's the level of engineering that we need to start talking about in the industry. Or my row is expected to accelerate at this rate at the end of the row, and that will increase the torsion at the end of that panel. And are we designing for that extra torsion from the vibration of the row? Right? And and all these things play into to the structural design that goes far beyond here's a static load on the solar panel, here's a simple code equation, let's input it and, and make sure it's okay. Right? We have to go way deeper than that to get these things to a reliable state. Um, there's also some trade-offs just in sort of the, the architecture you choose. You know, Dave mentioned sort of the static wind tunnel test, depending on the spacing of your peers, that can have an effect on, you know, the, the quantity of the wind load or the magnitude of the wind load and the gust size. But there's also some effects in regards to just the geometry of, of your system. And when you think back to that computational fluid dynamics, that CFD animation, Dave, Yep. You had um, some vortices forming on the high and low side, right? And those are, for a, a one module and portrait, those are about a meter apart from the center of the torque tube. So you can imagine a, you have a lever arm of a meter long. And just as an interesting architecture choice, if you were to go to two models and portrait, what sort of effect would that have on, on the torque? Right, so when you see that vortex really pulling on the end, it's, it's creating a great deal of uplift right on the outside quarter of the cord. And for a one for a two meter tracker, that's a half a meter. Um, but for a and, and a half meter lever arm, or one meter lever arm, for a, 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 if you double that, you'll have twice the area and twice the lever arm. So you know for the all everything else being equal, the span being the same, you'll have four times the torque from the same flow pattern. Right. And you just think about that sort of cascades down. So you have more torque, more vibration, all that stuff going on. And, and Alex, maybe you can speak to sort of some of the the, the approaches Next Tracker is taking to to addressing some of those dynamic concerns. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jake and Dave. Um, yeah. So so just to hit on this 2P tracker uh, as well, I think the industry standard right now is to just stow at zero degrees, and that only works for static loads. And as Dave and, and Jake just mentioned, there's so much more susceptible to that torsional galloping that it's really not safe for 2P trackers to stow at zero. Um, so what's also uh, not safe is the loosening of equipment over time. So next tracker's approach to all this movement that we've been discussing is to do two mitigation factors. Uh, the first of which is tension fastening. And this is compared to torque fastening, which is your typical nuts and bolts because all that movement is going to vibrate these panels um, and those torque fasteners, meaning the nuts and bolts, are going to loosen over time. So you really need to use these fasteners. A second point that's becoming popular within the solar industry right now is frameless modules. And when you look at frameless modules in portrait, there's really not a good gripping point on that. And through that movement over time, what you're going to see is rail slippage and potential breakage. Uh, so we'd encourage everyone to use frame designs. Um, and then what we want to see, too, is where's the proof of purchase? Um, so we see all this wind tunnel testing. 
we see the CFD analysis. Now let's see the real world results. So based on this research pioneered through CPP and through Next Tracker, we have survived Hurricane Matthew, Harvey, Irma, Maria, and just recently Florence without failure. So this is huge because you're going to see the largest wind loads affecting our structures and get really be put to the test. And they are back up and operating the next day. So this is where the solar industry really needs to take a hard stand. Because honestly, when all of these disaster videos are released on social media, it does harm to the full industry in general. Um, and when you look at LCOE analysis, this is actually what GTM covered in the beginning of this, as we race towards the bottom, there's too much of a focus on upfront costing. And when you think about these systems that are supposed to last 25, 30, or even 35 years, people really need to take into account how much O&M costs are going to come from anything beyond just inverter breakage or beyond just a combiner box not working, but dynamic wind effects actually causing failures to a tracker system. And what also really hurts us is if you think about not only do you need to pay for those parts to be replaced, but your system will be down. And all of us are in the business of generating revenue. So if the system is up and running for as much time as possible, that's what's best for everyone. And as Dave and, and Jake mentioned earlier, all these wind events between just 25 miles per hour and 60 miles per hour can happen once every few years that we expect some downtimes if you don't take the proper measures. So really, owners and EPCs need to require the proper wind tunnel testing if they're to put a system out there. So next, I also want to talk about some other risk mitigation factors. Um, one thing that recently happened with Hurricane Florence is beyond just the heavy winds, there was all that rainfall. And what they're going to see is flooding hitting that 100-year mark. So for this, Next Tracker puts its equipment all the way up against the torque tube right there. You can see all the controllers um, and all the necessary equipment towards that top of the torque tube. Uh, and secondly, on the right, we actually have an advanced flood stow algorithm in which we ultrasonically read flood depths. And here, in this guy kayaking and, and doing water sports through a, a site here, you can see those panels are lifted above the water level and efforts, one, to reduce steel costs for those piers, and two, to protect all the equipment. So when you think about all of this, this is, this is really what we all need to take into account um, as we move forward and try to have solar be that number one energy source. And when you think about independent engineers, if any independent engineers are on the phone, they're really doing owners a disservice if they, if they don't take into account this wind tunnel testing and dynamic analysis. And owners also need to start requiring this. Otherwise, we're going to see more disaster videos. So, Jake, do you want to talk about this, this study that DMV just released? Yeah, DMV, to their credit, I I'm, was really happy to see them publish this, this white paper recently on sort of guidelines for stakeholders on, on bankability studies. And it's, it was a great document, and I think it gets us you know, really close to where we need to be as an industry. Um, and you know, owners should not be shy about ensuring that these very valuable assets are backed by proper engineering, right? And, and DNVL and other independent, DNVGL and other independent engineers play a, a vital role in ensuring that's happening. Um, and this is a good place to start if you're an owner in EPC. Just go through this checklist that DNVGL put together and, and make sure. Now, as far as the wind stuff goes, you know, I've been working on, on this bit of research with Next Tracker and, and Dave Banks here for four years. So I've been inundated in it for four years. And I must say that I still um, do not understand the most fine of details about these things. And, and Dave is a very humble guy, but the truth is that these tests are very difficult to execute properly. Even more difficult once you have gobs and gobs of wind tunnel data to interpret it correctly. And so what we really need to establish as a standard is peer review from one wind tunnel professional to another. And you know, that could be professors at universities or other you know, private wind tunnel engineering firms. But establishing sort of a peer review, and, and Dave, can you sort of describe what this means to you as, as that person would be having your work reviewed? 
Yeah, as someone who's had my work reviewed and has done many peer reviews, they're really quite valuable. Um, one of the unique things about all the work that's been done in the last 10 years in solar is that most of it's subject to non-disclosure agreements. It's, um, it's intellectual property. It isn't published out there. So you can't just read a paper on what's the latest and greatest. And there is a latest and greatest. That's one of the big things. It's, if you just apply the same procedures and the same methods exactly as you do it for a tall building or some other structure, you're likely to slip up and, and miss something. Um, that's one of the things we've learned. And so getting someone to peer review um, a study, even from a reputable lab, uh, helps a lot. Um, one of the things we see when we get called in to investigate a failure a lot of times is that someone had a study and the study ticked all the boxes off. It looked like a good study, but it was giving loads that were lower than what were typically seen from other studies. And so, of course, the sales team thinks this is great because you can sell a lot, um, but it's a bit of a red flag if your numbers are lower than everybody else's. There should be something physical, some aspect of your stow, stow policy or geometry. There should be some explanation for why your numbers are coming in lower. And if they're not, it could just be oftentimes an innocent mistake. And the peer review will catch that. So I, I think peer review is good. We put it into AFC 7. It's one of the only places in the code where it's actually mandated uh, as an important part of the process. Right. And I, you know, for owners and EPCs may be concerned about the cost of a peer review, I would just say it's, it's a one-time cost for a supplier. Right? They, they go out and they get their wind tunnel testing done, and then they pay to have a review done of that study. And that review is usually much less than the cost of the actual study itself. And so it's, it shouldn't be a cost borne by a project because it, it happens once for your supplier. Right? And then they, they have this peer review and they just hand it to you. Here's my peer review. Here's showing that not only did I do the test, but that the test was done correctly, that this thing that people go to you know, get PhDs and study for their entire lives to do correctly is, is done properly because it's not simple. It's actually very complex to do. Yeah, thank you guys. So let's talk about seeing this in the, the real world now. So this is a video uh, that happened out in India just before the monsoon season, which you'll see got some extreme winds. And so one of the comments when we released this on LinkedIn that people most noticed immediately was that we weren't stowing at zero. The problem with stowing at zero is while it is good for foundation costs, it completely ignores dynamics. Uh, second of which, our system is completely damped, and you'll see when I play this video, all of these attributes that we just discussed go into a healthy system surviving a storm that would probably have failure otherwise. So let's go ahead and watch this video. So thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining us for this conversation. I also want to point out that we have a white paper that was just released that you can see on our website that has even more in-depth discussion on this. Um, it has the full videos of everything we just showed along with some more uh, criteria that you should be able to take into account. So at this point, um, I also want to thank Jake and Dave for joining me. And then we can now open up to a Q&A of anyone who has questions on this topic. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Um, yep, as Alex mentioned, we're, we're now in the Q&A portion of the webinar. As Just as a little reminder, you can continue submitting questions through the module to the right of your screen. We have 40 minutes for questions, so please submit them um, and uh, make sure that you um, ask all, all the questions that you have because there's a lot to, to chew over in this, in this webinar from the last 40 minutes. So. Um, Let's let's begin with with you, David. So this is directly from the audience here. So at at the high tilt angle, what are the peak local pressures on PV cells? It appears that micro cracking is very likely. Uh, in addition, we have a bunch of questions here on micro cracking. So um, if David or anyone else on the line here is willing to address that, that'd be great. 
Well, so we've been talking mostly about here about the wind loads on the tracking system itself, on the rack, on the posts, on the torque tube. Um, but you do get loads um, from the wind tunnel on the, the panels themselves. Um, and this is actually a whole other um, subject area is how do you accurately determine how a PV panel is going to handle the real world um, load lifetime loading of, of being a, on, a, on a tracking system. <laughs> the loads are very variable and they change a lot across the in time and in space. So you've got uneven loading across the panel. Um, and, and I'm not sure there is a good test right now to um, certify. If, if you go to a vendor sending you a PV panel and say, this is the lifetime of stress and strain that I expect this panel to handle, they won't have an answer for you and say, well, then you need this panel. They will have done a single static test where they put some sandbags on it and, you know, waited for a period of time and, and, and uh, examined it. So I don't know, Jake, do you have a... Yeah, you, you know, I can't disclose who, but I have seen certain panel manufacturers who have cyclic load testing on their panels where they're applying something like, you know, 72 cylinders and, and vibrating that panel through a series of vibrations and pressures. And that's that's a good good place to start, you know. it's you know, you guys, for owners and EPCs, you guys have expensive assets that you're putting out in the field. And, you know, it's worth doing your homework and asking these questions to who you're buying these things from, you know. And, and there's no harm in asking the questions, is, is what I would say. Yeah, and I feel um, like addressing dynamic loads is the best way to eliminate micro-cracking. Fantastic. So um, a question that I also have, but asked here from the audience, um, and anyone on the line, please feel to feel feel free to respond. So, at what stage are static wind tunnel tests, uh, these dynamic wind studies, what what at what stage of the project are they are they performed, or who, and who are these projects? Who are these studies done for? Are they done? by the EPC? Are they done by the developer? Are they done by the vendors themselves? At what stage in the project are these um, these tests being done and, and who's doing them? Yeah, I'll chime in here, Ben. This is Jake. So these are really part of the product design of your racking system, right? And they're, they're not part of the project design, per se. So they should be done during the product development of the racking system. Now there's some some site specific stuff you can get into when we look at like that airport data that I showed that that site had maybe a higher frequency for for opportunities for instability than compared to say a, a generically low wind site or something. So you can get more advanced on the site side, but these should be being performed by the product manufacturer and then they should have them peer reviewed on their own. And then when it comes time to purchase the product, um, the independent engineer, the owner, if they have their own engineering staff on hand, should be should be asking these questions. Did you do these studies? Have they been peer reviewed? Um, can you show me how you're addressing this instability that happens when you still at zero degrees, right? And and those are the sort of what a product manufacturer should be able to answer for you and answer with confidence. Mm -hmm. um, great question from the from the audience here. Uh, does this vary by geography? What what wind speeds do you normally recommend stowing? All right. Well, the decision about what wind speed to stow is going to be very site dependent um, and, and tracker dependent. You know, yeah. it, it depends. So, you know, if you have two models in portrait versus one in portrait, that will affect your stow speed. Um, if your row has a super stiff, super expensive torque tube. Right, you can stow at a higher wind speed, but if you've shaved steel out of your torque tube and, and now your frequency is kind of low, that will affect your stow speed. If you have uh, a double glass panel, so a heavier mass that your your tracking system is supported, that will affect your stow speed. So these, it's you have to do the studies, and and we're not talking about you know a thirty thousand dollar study here. We're talking about you know quarter of a million to half a million dollars in, in wind tunnel engineering, followed by another half million to three quarter of a million dollars in in 
internal engineering effort to get to these answers. Mm -hmm. um, in a similar vein, but what about for extreme wind events like a like a hurricane or a tornado? Even is there do you have a recommended stow angle? So the recommended stow angle. Um, well, in an extreme and a really high wind event, I think you don't want to be flat. Um, you know, I can't say that blanket because if you if you if you make it stiff enough, um, you know that you you may be able to show that that you're not having an issue. But but generally, um, the threshold between unstable and stable is sudden when you're flat, and it's just a question about what speed it's going to happen. So if the, if the wind speeds are high enough, then, I, then I'd stay away from flat, and I'd go for a, a high a high tilt stow. And this is sort of, there's sort of a, a cost trade-off here, and, and this is where your structural engineer has to work really closely with your, your wind engineer, is it's more stable to be at a high tilt position, right, to be in a almost like a sign position. That's a more stable dynamically position. But guess what? That results in higher loads on your peers. And so your peer costs go up, right? And so there's this balance between, you know, how much do your peers cost and how do you engineer to be safe at that 300 year wind speed versus are you safe at that low wind speed? Now, I would strongly bias your engineering to being safe at that low wind speed because they happen much, much more frequently. Right, the 300-year event, you have roughly a 0.33% chance of of having that event occur per year. Right, 0.33%. Some of these sites that we see trackers going in have roughly a, a 50 to 100% chance of seeing one of these instability events occur every year. Right, and so you have to address that instability first, and the best way to do that is to stow at a high tilt. Okay, gotcha. Um, Alex, for you, um, how are the, the U-bolts that connect the torque tube to the module rails affected by the wind, and, and how do you evaluate that at next tracker? Actually, Jake, I think you'd be better for this one if you wanted to answer that. Sorry, can you repeat the question, Ben? Sure. How are the U-bolts that connect the torque tube to the module rails affected by the wind? How do you evaluate it? Right. So let's start with sort of Dave's three, three pillars again, right? So the traditional way to evaluate it would be you take the static wind tunnel tests and you calculate the area that that U-bolt supports and you take that pressure and you apply it to the U-bolt, right? Well, then you can take one more step beyond that and you say, what about buffeting dynamics? You have this vortice shedding off an upwind tracker and it's sort of impacting those U-bolts down line. And so you sort of get a bump on your static factor, let's say 120 to 200%, right? So now you take your static factor and you multiply it by two. Well, now you have a force on your U-bolt there. Well, then let's talk about the instability. Because that's, that's one. You have sort of vortex lock-in and let's say you're stowed and, and your tracker starts to vibrate. And it might not be an extreme vibration. Maybe it's only bouncing 10 degrees or so. Um, and you have dampers, so it's stable, but it's a 90 mile per hour wind. You're going to have some vibration in the system. And you take that out at the end of the row, and it's vibrating at one hertz. Well, now you have sort of an angular acceleration at the end of your row and a mass moment of inertia of your panel. And you end up with a torque all of a sudden on that U-bolt. Oh, so now we have to design for this torque, and that torque happens to be pretty high, right? And so all of these things sort of factor in together. Now, the rest of that is, we, that's sort of the loading side. You start to get into the structural analysis of, of the U-bolt and pull through on the, on the cold form steel of the, of the bolt through the cold form steel, and there's, you know, 10 or so checks that you would do on that U-bolt, you know, from the, the steel shearing itself to the material it's, it's grabbing onto, pulling over, so. A few questions here about uh, how snow loading and, uh, and, and wind testing work in tandem. So are, are snow loads considered in wind testing, for example, blizzards in northern latitudes? Um, so 
as far as I know, and Jake can confirm, snow loading is typically just a load combination. So we'll provide accurate wind loads, and then you have to assume that some fraction of the peak snow load might also occur at the time when the peak wind event happens, and vice versa. Some fraction of the peak wind load will happen when the peak, um, when you've got a lot of snow on there. However, a lot of times when you look at the design snow event, it totally changes the geometry of the tracker. I mean, you, you've got feet of snow piled on top of the tracker. So the aerodynamics are going to be quite different. So I think it's an open question as to whether these load combinations really cover what's going on because, the, um, you know, you've got, you've got wind loads that are no longer really quite accurately representing uh, the, the flow around the tracker that you're using a factor of. Um, so, right, and and the building code, even for regular buildings, doesn't really adjust that change in shape, right? So if you think about like your typical parapeted building, now your parapet has a drift against it. That wind flow changes around that parapet and stuff like right. that. Right, this isn't unique to, to yeah. solar. Yeah, um, Dave is right that you're you're combining the loads per the code. The the interesting thing about a tracker, Ben, is that trackers move and they tend to move to high tilts twice a day or, or three times a day. And so snow events, if you think about a building, what you're designing for is a snowstorm that lasts several days or even a month. You know, you get a, a, a snowstorm that comes in on the first of the month and then one on the fifth and then one on the tenth. And then all of a sudden you get a big one that blows in on the 18th and all of a sudden on your building you have this giant mass of snow on your roof. And that's really what the code is, is geared towards. And then you think about a wind event. A wind event is happening over a period of, of minutes or hours at the most, right? And so you sort of have this, this time delay that's not well represented in the code happening on trackers, where trackers are dumping the snow two or three times a day off them, and then the wind comes along. And so there's that could be a whole separate topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we could spend mm -hmm. three hours on that. So there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between code and, and what actually is required in the field. Is, is there anything that um, an, an EPC or a developer can do beyond wind tunnel testing to obtain like, confidence in their design for a PV system? Yeah, I think I could take this one. Um, you know, Jake answered about designing for rails at the connection, but really we also can talk about reliability. And what we have, at least at Next Tracker, is a yard in the back of our headquarters, which we do cyclical testing, life cycle testing, and do all this testing uh, beyond just what's on the code, so what we're going to see out in the real world. So if you can conduct this reliability testing, you can really see a lot less failures happening out in the field as well. And gotcha. Ben, if I could just chime in here. I, Please. You go to ASC 7, which is the standard for wind loading on structures. The title of the standard is the minimum design standard for loading. And the, the key word there is minimum, right? And, and the codes are minimum standards. And there's, there's nothing here that can't be found out, right? The, wind, the, the technology to do the wind tunnel testing is there. Um, the technology to do these complex structural analysis is there. Um, it's just a matter of investing the time and energy to do it, you know, and and we need to break away from, you know, doing the bare minimum that's required by the code just to get a permit and put it in the ground. And we need to start thinking about this at, This is an asset. This is a an investment that needs to last for 25, 30, 35 years. And if you're having to go out there and repair it and have downtime every single year, there's real, real dollars in that, and and the when you think about a two hundred million dollar plant, you know, are you really going to cheap out on the investment or the engineering? I mean, that's that's a seems like an easy trade to me. Yeah. You yeah. know, we keep seeing, especially trackers installed in far corners of the world, where there's so much cost pressure that some of these systems won't even last one or two years. So they really have already lost their investment, even if they've saved a few bucks at upfront install. Mm -hmm. uh, so this transitions into the, my next question here. You talked a little bit about downtime, but and let's not say the entire system is 
completely destroyed. But what are the O&M cost impacts uh, that can be reduced by doing this type of testing? Yeah, I think really when you look at it, um, if you have to send someone out to the field and it's not generating revenue, I think is the key. That's, that's the big measure. You know, we've met with a lot of owners who honestly say the part replacement is, isn't what kills them. It's really the amount of downtime, whether it just be a small section of the plant or a large section of the plant, that when it's not producing power, that's going to far outweigh the cost of the parts out there. Um, so when you look at O&M costs, obviously for parts it's going to vary, but what isn't going to vary is that energy production and the PPA rates that you get and you always want to be producing revenue, and you always want to be producing power. Right, and Ben, the key term here is actually a term called availability. And there's, there's reliability, the, let's say the, the, the likelihood that something will break, and then there's availability in terms of how quickly can it be up and running, or if it breaks, what kind of downtime does that have? Um, and the industry is very comfortable talking about reliability. It's, it's a pretty familiar concept. Um, Next Tracker went ahead and, and hired a, a PhD to, to write a white paper about availability versus reliability and, and how you might go about evaluating that on a tracking system in particular. So, Great. Um, no, thank you for clarifying. That's an important distinction for our audience. Generally speaking, what is the reaction time of a tracker against high speed wind events, Alex? Yeah, well, it depends on your architecture. Um, since we don't have a linked row system, we have a very quick tracking time to stow. In a worst case scenario, it could be about two minutes, but really it depends on the angle which you are currently tracking at. And we're typically under a minute, and that's because we're that independent row system, and we can just move so closely. We use that same technology with True Capture, in which we can change angles very quickly. So having such an easy moving system is really advantageous, not for energy yield, but also for combating wind in this instance. Ben, one of the, the coolest things I've seen having worked with Next Tracker is how on earth do you intend to ensure that 14 gigawatts worth of trackers are ready to go to stow at any moment's notice? Right, that's, that's sort of like a, a daunting proposition, right? Yeah. But the interesting thing, Next Tracker has a computer that's monitoring the status of every single row that they've ever they've ever put out there. Now, they just need to hook them up to the internet. So if you have a site with Next Tracker, you hook it up to the internet, and Next Tracker knows if a row is capable of going to stow, or if it's having trouble going to stow on a certain day, and they actively track that and monitor that and and take steps to make sure these rows are all ready for that for when that event happens and you have to move quickly. Um, just a couple more questions here. We're coming up to about 3 o'clock here on the East Coast of the United States. Um, so how do advanced software control systems help secure tracking systems during wind events, Alex? Yeah, so we have anemometers placed around the site which will read speed and direction. And so when we think about that, um, if we test that speed over a certain threshold in which we deviate for every site individually, it'll change that the whole site will go to stow. Um, and this can happen very quickly. Uh, we have a wireless mesh network in which the entire site will go to stow in, the, in just a matter of seconds with respect to the signal, and then just about a minute or so with respect to the actual movement of those trackers. Okay, our last question here before we wrap this up. Um, is there any kind of estimation on the number of projects that have been seriously impacted by these wind issues, um, either in the USA or, or other countries? Because we, we often see videos like this, either on LinkedIn or where have you, but there's no real data. Is there any sort of data that you can provide on the on the frequency of projects being impacted by wind events? You know, I haven't seen any data, um, but what I do know is just browsing LinkedIn, seeing some of these groups on Facebook, seeing some videos on YouTube, is it becomes a very common occurrence, unfortunately, to have these disaster videos. 
And really, it's been known within the industry for this to happen. It just hasn't been until recent that it's been released. And like we sort of mentioned in the beginning of this broadcast is that it's really bad for the whole industry when this happens because all of us want solar to go to the mainstream. And when these events happen, it takes it down a notch. So that's where everyone, the IEs, the owners, the EPCs, and of course the racking manufacturers need to do is demand that it have the right analysis, otherwise it's simply not going to last. That is a perfect way to bring us to the end of today's presentation. Uh, I'd like to once again thank our partners at Next Tracker for making this discussion we just heard possible. Uh, this presentation will be available for on-demand replay for three months on the GTM website. So please share with your colleagues and feel free to rewatch at any time. I want to give a shout out to Ashley Fallon who uh, manages our webinars and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you again on the next GTM webinar. Thank you very much and have a pleasant day.